All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We will go ahead and get started. I know some people are rolling in, so um, welcome everybody that has joined today. We're going to be joined by Stephen Krauss and myself. We're going to be talking about 2021 consumer outlook and top trends that brands and marketers need to know. So Stephen, this is an annual tradition for you, as I understand it. Is that right? That's right. You know, growing up, New Year's was always my favorite holiday for some weird reason. And I always just loved making New Year's resolutions and thinking back over the year that was and what were the highlights and what were the lessons to be learned and making plans for the future. So it's always just kind of fascinated me since I was a kid. And so in recent years, I've taken to uh, to doing a a webinar that does exactly that, looks back at the year that was and offers some thoughts about the year that's going to come. Perfect. I think it's always good to do a retroflexion of the previous year and then, you know, look forward to the coming year. So that's awesome. Uh, so Stephen is the CEO of Next Level Science Sciences, and he also has a podcast, Consumers During Corona. So um, I've been on this podcast. I've listened to a lot of episodes. It's fantastic. It's well produced. I recommend giving that a listen. And then I'm Dan Fleetwood. I lead the research and insights platform here at Question Pro. I have a show um, in addition to this webinar. So uh, Friday Live with Dan, have different guests on, different segments. It's a fun time, a little bit different format and medium than a traditional webinar. So feel free to check that out. And I'll, that'll be tomorrow at 11. And I know Stephen, you can find Stephen's podcast anywhere where I think podcasts can be streamed. Is that That's right, Stephen, right? That is correct. And uh, okay. yeah, I'm really enjoying the podcast. I interview a lot of leaders in the field and uh, still to this day, the most downloaded episode that I ever did was with you, Dan and uh, Vivek from Question. Hey, you know, I'm not going to toot my own horn, but that's, that's fantastic. There you go. I'm going to have to start paying you affiliate fees or something. <laughs> hey, we'll talk about this after the webinar. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, should we uh, jump right into it? Let's, let's do it. Let's jump right in. Okay. Well, you know, as I mentioned, I've always kind of been really interested in this idea of let's take a look at the takeaways from the year that was and make some uh, projections about what might happen in the year to come. And uh, it's actually kind of been inspired by uh, the Roman god Janus. And uh, you see a coin uh, depicting Janus there. And Janus had uh, two faces, one looking forward and one looking back. Uh, Janus was, among other things, the Roman god of, of doorways and beginnings and transitions. And many people believe, it's a little controversial within archaeology, but many people believe this is where the name of the month January comes from. Uh, but regardless, you can see how, you know, two faces looking forward, back, doorways, beginning, it's all kind of a very similar kind of theme. So we are going to, uh, you know, take a look first at the trends in the year that was, and then make some predictions for the coming year. Uh, predictions obviously uh, aren't easy, so I'm sure we won't be 100% right about everything. Um, and um, uh, let's see, oh, now I'm getting a message here. I should start my video. Is that right, Dan? Uh, we can just go ahead without yeah. the video, unless okay. you want to, it's up okay. to you. Awesome. So, and I know whenever I was a kid, my, uh, I, I would ask my dad, hey, what are we doing tonight? What are we doing tomorrow? My dad would always say, if I could predict the future like that, I'd be at the racetrack. So <laughs> despite all the concerns and difficulties with predicting the future, uh, we're, we're going to give it a shot. But first, let's take a look at the year that, uh, that was. That's actually a photo that uh, I took of a woman looking out over the, the stormy seas here in Pacifica, California, where I live. So if we look back at the year 2020, I mean, obviously, it starts and ends with a discussion of the, of the pandemic. Uh, and that's been covered in many, many places. And I'm not an epidemiologist, nor do I even pretend to, to play one on TV, my expertise is more in consumer trends. So let's talk about the consumer trends that were really shaped by the coronavirus. This is a lot of what my podcast is about, consumers during corona. And you'll often hear people say that, well, it, it accelerated some trends that had already started, but in other ways, it was it really disrupted certain trends. So let's take a look at some of those. And uh, as you see, I'm, I'm not going to go through every single number on these slides, but we all know that uh, e-commerce had been growing quickly for many years, and it's really accelerated. 
Now, it's always remarkable to me if you look at government data from the Commerce Department that still only about 12 to 14 percent of all retail sales are online. So there remains tremendous growth opportunities. You see the numbers from eMarketer over there on the left where they uh, predicted that uh, 2020, when everything was, was going to be said and done, was going to be about a 32% increase in e-commerce. Um, so, um, uh, you know, certainly that's a big, that's a big step function. And uh, you'll see people speculate, well, it was an increase, uh, you know, it's like the, uh, the e-commerce market aged two years in one year, or maybe it was 10 years. It does sort of depend on the category that you look at. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Certainly e-commerce for grocery went up much, much further than that. So obviously that's an example of a, you know, a trend that was, was already growing strongly and the pandemic was really an accelerant. E-commerce, e-commerce for grocery in particular. Uh, we're also gonna talk about this idea and yeah, not a big surprise, but when you look at digital markets, you see you know, winner take all kinds of economies. You see a few huge players that really dominate their category, whether it's Amazon or Google or Facebook. Uh, you see that all over the internet and you see it within e-commerce in particular. So uh, you see uh, the, the Amazon sales number there that are, you know, six times the nearest competitor of Walmart. Uh, now, and even though this is uh, a chart showing the growth in e-commerce sales, and you see how really, really strong those are, um, I think it also highlights that a lot of the brands on that list, a lot of those retailers are really known for a strong brick and mortar presence. So, you know, from Home Depot to Best Buy to Target, to Walmart, so on. Uh, I think it really highlights the importance of, uh, of being omnichannel. Uh, and so uh, I think we'll see that as we go along as well. So certainly e-commerce is one area where there was an accelerant, as I mentioned, the whole notion of digital dominators, that you can pick any category. And if you look at those dominators, if you just look at them in terms of market share, you saw them during the pandemic pull away from competitors. Here, we're looking at stock growth. So uh, you see you know, just how well all of those digital dominators have done, you know, far outperforming the market led by Apple and Amazon, uh, but going down the list of all the other you know, tech dominators that are familiar. Uh, another trend that I've studied a lot that has really been accelerated by coronavirus was uh, economic bifurcation. So the rich getting richer, uh, the affluent class sort of becoming more distinct from a consumer behavior point of view than, than the middle class. And uh, the numbers really suggest that coronavirus has accelerated economic inequality in, in just about every country. It's true if you look at the very, very top of the economic spectrum, if you're looking at billionaires, you've seen huge growth in, uh, in their net worth. Uh, very few billionaires saw their net worth uh, shrink. Uh, a lot of new billionaires have been uh, minted since uh, coronavirus started. It's kind of been a shakeup at the top of the list of the richest people in the world, where now uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk sort of go back and forth, depending on where their stock might be on any given day, uh, followed by uh, Bernard Annault of uh, LVMH and, uh, and Bill Gates. And then over on the right, you see uh, some data from uh, Scott Galloway, and I love his stuff. He's always got very interesting insightful perspectives. Uh, and so he's pulled some data from different recessions and uh, the coronavirus situation. And you really see how uh, there's been much more of an impact on, uh, on low earning consumers. And you can see that for, uh, for, for more affluent consumers who are in more executive positions, they just, they, they work from home, business goes on, life goes on. Uh, but if you think about consumers at the lower end of the spectrum, then it's a different story. So many of them in uh, restaurant jobs or service jobs, they've lost those jobs. Many of them are, uh, you know, you know, quote unquote, essential workers. And so they've got to, um, uh, you know, sort of, you know, adjust to all the disruption going on in the economy. Um, so, I mean, those are, those are some examples of trends that were already going and now are being accelerated. But there are also many examples of the ways in which the pandemic has been a disruptor to consumer behavior. So, uh, you know, we've all seen unemployment numbers. We know that economic anxiety is really high. Uh, I think one of the more overlooked trends has been in terms of savings rates. So here you see savings rates uh, from, uh, from uh, the, the federal government. 
Uh, and you can see just that that huge spike and still remains very, very elevated, just about at, at all time highs over the past, um, you know, uh, 60 or 70 years. So um, so this is really going to set us up for thinking about, well, what are trends going to be like in 2021? when uh, consumers are, are, you know, many of them, at least at the upper end of the economic spectrum, are sort of sitting on piles of cash. Another obvious disruptor of the corona economy has been the change in everyone spending so much more time at home. You know, sociologists used to talk about there were three places in modern life. There was home as the first place and work as a second place. And then all those third places, the bars, the restaurants, the coffee shops, the bookstores, where people would, would congregate. And obviously all of that has been brought into the home. So a lot of ways to look at this. I think it's interesting to look at uh, search volume on Google Trends. And uh, you can see the, the various spikes in things like, you know, people are now bringing the office home. There are, there are more people in the home. So with people not going off to work, we also know that um, uh, boomerang kids, those kids, uh, uh, you know, uh, young adults, 18 to 29, about half of them now living at home. And that's essentially an all time high. And, you know, the, the, the gym, the workout center has been brought home. And so one of the implications of that is consumers are looking for ways to kind of find more, more space within the home, whether that's a, a physically different room that you might do with a room divider or creating a, a psychological space like a, like a breakfast nook or uh, uh, something like a, a Murphy bed, which is a bed that kind of folds up into the wall and is a good space saving kind of thing. So we've seen consumers try to readjust what the home is like. And another very consistent aspect of the corona economy is consistent stocking up. And so, uh, you know, you may remember back when COVID hit just about a year ago, there was, you know, quote unquote, panic buying and there wasn't toilet paper on the shelves. There's actually been some really interesting research suggesting that that was not so much panic buying. That was more, you know, reasoned, thoughtful consumption because people were going to be spending more time at home that, you know, sometimes you would, without getting too graphic about it, you would use toilet paper at work or your kids would use toilet paper at school. And now with everybody home all the time, there's just a, a greater need for toilet paper. And, uh, you know, supply chains weren't quite prepared for everyone buying more at once, but it wasn't necessarily panic in part because the, the purchase of those kinds of consumer packaged goods has continued to remain elevated. So there's been a real change in how people are consuming. They're going to the store uh, perhaps less often, but they're really stocking up. And so even now, a year later, uh, we still see CPG buying as up, you know, about 20% on average. Sort of depends what metrics you look at. Uh, the top categories uh, are... Uh, uh, you see over there on the right, meat, frozen foods, and alcohol, which uh, really, really makes me feel on trend. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly me. Meat, frozen foods, and alcohol. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm yeah. part of that too, so yeah, you're okay. not alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I should be reassured by that or troubled by that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe um, a little both. We'll yeah, yeah. You know, another kind of obvious implication of the corona economy is that people are thinking a lot more and thinking a lot differently about cleanliness and what does that mean. Uh, so again, over on the right, uh, just like from the last slide, I should have mentioned those data come from NC Solutions, uh, which is a, a really interesting company. They've got great data. I actually interviewed the chief research officer on my podcast, so I've got a, a link to it there. Uh, but they've got, got really amazing data. And so uh, very good at also looking at, as you see on the right, uh, you know, continued elevation of spending in all of these cleanliness kinds of categories. And you can kind of get a sense there for what, what's more important and less important. Uh, there's also over on the left, I won't read through all the words there, but I published an article, you can find it on my website, about uh, you know, home-related trends in the corona economy. And one I would kind of highlight is in terms of home design, uh, mudrooms are coming back. So, you know, a, a mudroom is, you know, you come home, it's kind of like a little section outside your house. It's not quite in your house. The idea is you take off your shoes because they're muddy. But now people come home and they, you know, they're kind of taking off their clothes out there and, you know, switching into their, to their home clothes as opposed to their outdoor clothes. Um, and I'm not sure how 
biologically cleansing that actually is, but it provides kind of a psychological sense of, you know, uh, a, a sense of cleanliness, a sense of distinction between home and, and outside. Um, and the whole notion of cleanliness is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's what's underlying a lot of other trends that we've seen. We've seen coin shortages, we've seen rise in e-payments because cash is kind of perceived as, as dirty. Uh, or you've had some really interesting uh, uh, partnerships with uh, Lysol. Uh, Dan, we were talking about that the other day, some of Lysol's interesting partnerships. Yeah, Lysol, you know, partnered with the Major League Baseball, you know, for cleanliness of stadiums and to help portray that, you know, perception that it's, it's, it's good to come back and view live sports. So I think that's interesting. And then, you know, Steve, you were mentioning about sort of the mud room and, you know, we kind of do the same, the same thing where it's almost like the room to get disinfected before you come into the house. So I think it's more psychological than anything, but it's I can uh, I can attest to that. I suppose that's another example where I'm living very on trend too, and I think it is probably more psychological than than anything else. But uh, yeah, I come home and a lot of times, um, you know, if I've been out for you know, even just for a run, I'll kind of take off my outdoor sweats and leave those outside on the on the porch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, people are really hungering for that. And and Lysol, like I said, is a really interesting example. And uh, when I interview people on my podcast, I always ask them, what what brands do you think are really getting it right today? And a couple people have mentioned Lysol, both for these innovative yeah. partnerships. Uh, they've also done kind of all the all the research, all the R and D to prove that their product kills the coronavirus. And so they can go out and you know, legally make that claim uh, in, in the marketplace. Um, uh, another uh, uh, big trend that's, that's very much a, a, a disruption in the way things were is in uh, overall risk aversion. Uh, so here's some data from, uh, from Kantar, the consulting firm, from their long-running tracking study, the Kantar Monitor, and you see how um, you know just this year there's been a you know a huge drop, almost by half of the people who say you know I'm willing to take some risks. Uh, there's much more of a risk aversion mindset. I think not only in in financial investments, but in life in general. So obviously 2020, as we look back at it, was, was a disaster for so many people. And I don't mean to make light of it. And obviously many people lost their lives. Um, so it's obviously a very, very serious thing. Um, if, if we look purely from a, you know, a, a financial or a business point of view, I do think there were some, some winners, quote unquote, in the corona economy. Uh, every pizza outlet is up. Uh, Dan, we've talked about, about Cave Day, which is kind of an interesting website where you can go and just, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's virtual, so it's sort of like Zoom, but you can go in and be really, really focused. And so they have coaching to make sure you're not distracted, and they have, you know, work sprints, and uh, it's just an interesting application of, uh, you know, with so many people now living with unstructured times and trying to get work done and trying to be productive, you know, what are some uh, services really built for the digital world that are, that are helpful for people in that way? Yeah, it's interesting. It's like a accountability partner, but for the, your home office, right? So it's an interesting concept. I would encourage people to take a look at Cave Day, if nonetheless, just to pique your curiosity, but it's yeah. interesting. At, at my son's high school, they use it also, and they have certain cave days mm. just as an idea of trying to get people to focus on things. Um, I, I won't go through every one on here. Uh, the Houston Astros uh, who were you know, involved in a big cheating scandal about winning the World Series that before coronavirus hit, they were the talk of you know, every sports podcast of, of ESPN all day long. There was a tremendous focus on this, this historic cheating scandal. It was completely knocked off the headlines. Um, streaming services are kind of, you know, on, on the one hand, both an obvious winner because so many people are doing so much more streaming at home. Uh, the other thing I think is interesting because production on so many shows has been shut down a lot of them are spending a lot less money. So there were some numbers the other day that uh, Netflix just hit 200 million subscribers globally and their financial balance sheet looks so much better because they're not spending the billions and billions of dollars that they were on, uh, on new programming development. Um, 
So, uh, so there are some other uh, examples of, of winners on there. Uh, the one that I would highlight people may not be as familiar with uh, the Geffen Stay House. So that used to be the Geffen Playhouse, a well-known theater out in Los Angeles. And they kind of rebranded themselves the Geffen Stay House. And they had some really innovative things like, like magic shows and public performances that were specifically designed for a Zoom kind of environment. They weren't just taking the same old thing they were doing before and putting it on Zoom. They were really kind of innovative. Um, so Dan, I don't know if there are others on that list that kind of jump out at you as particularly interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, the Geffen State House is interesting to me. We, we did, had a magician on one of our live events and they incorporated Zoom and everything. and. I was blown away. I'm still sort of, my mind is still a little messed up from it, but it was super interesting. I thought that was good. The one that I hadn't really thought about before you, you showed this to me was sort of the mortality markets of wills, trusts, life insurance. It yeah. makes sense. Now it's like kind of one of those obvious ones that I, I just didn't think about, but people probably more concerned with their mortality based on all this and rightfully so. So that was one that I thought was really interesting. Yeah, it's uh, certainly been an event that's made people think about you know, the possibility of mortality. I've got to have my affairs in order. I've got to make sure that you know my family will, uh, you know, be okay if something that happens to me. Um, and you know, there are obvious the the obvious concerns around getting getting COVID and the health results from that. But there have actually been other studies showing that, uh, for example, uh, traffic accidents, traffic fatalities uh, were, were very high last year. Even though there were fewer people on the road, mm -hmm. there was kind of more, more risky driving behavior, more younger people on the road. Um, there's been a lot about, uh, about mental health kinds of issues. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, so yeah, so mortality markets have kind of seen a, a boom as well as mobility markets with more people uh, moving around. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's kind of a look back at 2020, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, mostly the ugly. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the consumer mindset today. And so here we're sharing some data that uh, uh, we, we collected together, uh, uh, me and, uh, and Dan and the good team at uh, Question Pro. Uh, and so uh, we've been tracking uh, since uh, this past summer, some, mm -hmm. some basic consumer mindset kind of metrics, uh, you know, over on the left, the standard question that many pollsters ask a right track, wrong track kind of question. Uh, and so we see 70% on the wrong track and you might wonder why it's, why it's not 90%. I think it does speak to, to the division in the country, which we'll talk about a little bit more and which is, you know, obviously in, in headlines, but uh, you know, that 70% on the wrong track is at historic highs. And you see over on the right, some of the more attitudinal kinds of measures that get at the notion that people have, have a fundamentally strong sense of anxiety about where things are. Um, and I'm kind of struck by the, the one item uh, on the lower right there, uh, the one of those items that's, that's gone down significantly since we started tracking uh, mm -hmm. last summer. Young people today would be better off than their parents' generation. I mean, this historically has been one of the fundamental tenets of the American dream. Everybody assumed that the next generation was going to be better off. And uh, now people are, are really questioning that. Um, now, one area where we do see perhaps a little bit of, uh, of encouraging movement toward consensus is when we ask about things like social distancing and wearing masks and we give people just a simple uh, force choice. How do you think about those? Uh, we've now got 82% saying necessary to save lives and that's rising. Uh, a number that hasn't changed is over on the right. What are you more worried about the economy or the coronavirus? It splits about 60-40 and that, that hasn't uh, particularly changed. Yeah, Stephen, sure. I remember in regard to like social distancing, wearing masks, when we first asked this, it wasn't close to 82%, right? That number is way up since we first started this. That is, that's up at least 10 percentage points since since yeah. last summer. Um, so I, I, I think that's encouraging in an area where we see, you know, so much division in the country that if you do, like we did, you know, a truly representative national sample, Mm -hmm. you do see a, a move toward toward more consensus. So that's yeah, yeah. encouraging. 
And I think people are more used to it now, right? I know you like wearing a mask. You've told me so. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, well, what I learned personally from coronavirus is a, I was never getting within six feet of anybody anyway, and uh, and I like wearing a mask. I uh, there's no need for uh, for fake smiles. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, oh, that's, yeah, you, that's interesting. Yeah, you, you take what you can get when you're looking for positive outcomes from 2020. <laughs> very true. Very true. Yeah. You know, another set of questions that we asked that I think is really interesting is we tried to to dimensionalize optimism. You know, you hear uh, survey data about optimism and consumer confidence, and a lot of times it's boiled down to a number. But obviously, people's lives are complex, and so we tried to dimensionalize a little bit of how people are, are thinking about areas of their life. Uh, so we had about a dozen areas of people's lives from personal things, to professional things, to family related things. And we've been tracking, you know, how do people feel things are going in that area today? Uh, and so, you know, we asked that back in 2020 on the horizontal axis and 2021, uh, just, uh, just about a week ago uh, on the vertical axis. And you see pretty much everything is to the lower right of that diagonal line, uh, meaning that we were more positive about all of these things in uh, the last summer as opposed to now, the one exception being uh, the stock market. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about the stock market. A lot of interesting stuff going on there. So, uh, so, and I don't think this is really a big surprise, just given that you know the coronavirus situation continues on. It looks like it's going to chew up at least the first half of 2021, if not more. Uh, and then everything else that's happened, you know, politically and otherwise, I think, has driven this, you know, you know, lower sense of optimism on all of these dimensions. But I think the other really interesting nuance is, you know, on this slide, we're looking at, well, how do people rate these things today? We also ask, well, how do you think these things are going to be going at the end of 2021? And uh, again, we've got kind of the, the same set of axes there. And so it's just interesting to see how do things fall relative to that diagonal line? And basically, uh, all of the societal elements that people think about are, are getting about the same ratings as they were uh, last summer. So if you ask, you know, how are these things going to be going at the end of 2021? We're kind of thinking the same way now that we were last summer in terms of how good things are, are going to be. I mean, kind of middling. I mean, in absolute terms, they're, you know, hovering about a six or six and a half on a 10 point scale. But I think what's interesting, again, are all the things uh, off on the lower right of, of that chart, suggesting that uh, you know, our expectations for all those things closer to home have really fallen. Um, you know, when we first started talking about this, uh, Dan, we, we used the phrase bifocal optimism, and people were so much more optimistic about things up close and personal in their lives than in the country as a whole. But when we ask again about future expectations, we're really seeing people kind of having, having lower expectations. They think the country as a whole is kind of going to rebound by the end of the year, but they're not sure their lives are going to rebound as, as much as they might have hoped. Yeah, that's interesting that you ask someone in different, you know, kind of context of the question and they would say, well, I'm optimistic about, you know, the things right in front of me, right? That was the context of that. And then this is they're not so optimistic about, you know, those things like mental health, family members' lives. But then one thing that, that was interesting to me on here is that just the the stark of like, yeah, people are super optimistic at the end of 2021 about these things going on in the world, the stock market, the US economy. And then still, like you were mentioning, it's almost the same as um, you know, for all the other, the personal um, like expectations and things that haven't mm -hmm. really changed. So kind of interesting. I'm not sure why or, or what, but it, it's interesting points nonetheless. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that they, as they think about the end of this year, they do see kind of America and, you know, all of those social and political elements kind of getting back to, to, uh, to where they were, but where we see that sense of lowered personal expectations uh, is, is, is pretty interesting. And I think you're right. If you just ask people, well, you know, are you optimistic about your life in these different ways? People would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You get a lot of that in survey responses. But by tracking mm -hmm. this over time, I think we get an interesting perspective about how personal expectations have fallen. 
uh, one of my uh, colleagues who I had on the uh, I had on the podcast, uh, Walker Smith, who's a well-known trend forecaster. Uh, I, I asked him, you know, what advice are you giving brands these days? And one of the things he said was, "How can you help people live big lives in a smaller world?" And mm in a smaller world, both literally in the sense that we're all in the home now all the time, but also I think in terms of the data on this slide, if we're living in a world of kind of lowered personal expectations of, wow, you know, I'm still worried about, you know, my paycheck and my career and my family, you know, how can brands, you know, reassure people? And, and I thought it was just such a great phrase. How can you help people live big lives in a smaller world? Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> Well, let's do a, a couple more slides on uh, kind of putting 2020 uh, in, in perspective and where consumers are right now. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about some projections for the future and then we'll, we'll open it up for some questions. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the first of a couple of really interesting slides uh, where we simply ask people in a completely open-ended way, what kind of brands are, are particularly meaningful or important to you? Uh, so over on the right, we have data from a study that uh, I used to run uh, many years ago called Women, Power, and Money that was put out by Hearst Communications and Fleischmann Hillard. And uh, there's some publicly available white papers uh, that uh, are still very relevant today and had a lot of interesting data. Uh, but, uh, but you see what that charts what that word cloud looked like over on the right in 2013 and then we asked it again uh in in october uh now i of course am a am a trained scientist so i can tell you probably the least scientific thing you could do is to compare two different word clouds that are different time periods different fonts different color schemes having said that let's go ahead and compare them anyway uh you know <laughs> I'm actually teaching qualitative research methods at University of San Francisco right now. So I'm used to sort of giving all the caveats about qualitative and it's, it's directional, it's interpretive. Um, so, uh, so here we're looking at, uh, at uh, you know, how, how women uh, responded. Um, and you know, certainly see, you see some consistencies. You know, Amazon is very strong. Uh, you see uh, you know, Nike as, as a lot stronger now than it was back then. I think that speaks to you know, life at home and athleisure and you know, we're wearing uh, different kinds of things. Uh, so, you know, Apple does well. Um, I think uh, it's interesting that you do see some consumer packaged goods brands showing up strongly now, things like Dove and Shure, uh, and, uh, and you see Clorox as a brand there. I think it's interesting back in 2013 that we saw Procter & Gamble. Now, obviously, that's kind of, a, you know, that's a that, that, that's a company, that's an umbrella brand. And I think as time has gone on, they've made efforts to kind of market their individual brands rather than, than the parent brand. So it's, it's interesting to see how that, uh, that strikes uh, us. Um, so I don't know, Dan, do you have other uh, thoughts on, on the brands here? Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. Obviously you see some of the ones that are still pretty consistent from like you mentioned, Apple and Target and Nike, but then you know, things that, that were showed up really well in in 2023, or excuse me, 2013, like, you know, you mentioned the Procter & Gamble, but ones that I'm interested in are like, um, you know, in 2020, we see, sure, we see Johnson & Johnson, Clorox, Lysol. So I think you're right, more of those individual brands as opposed to umbrella companies. That's interesting. And then, of course, like the, you know, Netflix obviously shows up in 2020, but Mm -hmm. It's sort of a blip, I think, in 2013. Mm -hmm. So this is what we'd seen for women uh, when we look at the, uh, the same set of, uh, of results for men. Uh, we see a couple of interesting things. So back in 2013, you know, Apple was, uh, was, you know, by far the largest and then Amazon was a close second. Now those two are, you know, you know, still coming out very strongly. Uh, you see, uh, uh Walmart and Target, uh, show up a lot more strongly. So I think a focus on, on retail and, you know, people are going out to, to stock up. Like I said, it's fewer trips out to the store, but buying more stuff. And there's just more focus on that because you've got to gear up for it and you got to have masks, you got to be prepared and you got to go in and out. Just kind of the, the, the herd buying technique that we were talking about the other day. Um, you also see, uh, you know, men a little bit more easily distracted by, uh, by bright, shiny things uh, than, than women. <laughs> so you see a lot of, uh, in addition to Apple, a lot of Microsoft, Sony, uh, Samsung, 
you know, you see Nike as, as much stronger for men now than it was, uh, as we saw for women. Uh, but you also see uh, Adidas and some other, you know, sports related brands, Under Armour, North Face, you see kind of a, a, a different element on the, on the athleisure apparel for men. Uh, Dan, what, what do you think? Yeah, and I think you also see like automobile, right? Automobile manufacturers like Ford, Toyota, um, you know, GM that you, you didn't see on the women's. Uh, so that, I guess, kind of makes sense if you're playing into those, you know, norms. But um, I think on both of these, what's interesting is like Nike, uh, Adidas, you know, uh, all of these, you know, sort of athletic brands that really are standing out. I think it's really interesting. And these are iconic brands too, right? So it kind of makes sense. And then Under Armour showing up more in 2020. Uh, same with like, if you see Costco is there, that mm -hmm. I don't really see it in 2013. So really interesting, but yeah, you're right. A little bit more kind of shiny objects. And it's funny the, the different things that both, you know, men and women kind of associate uh, with meaningful or important to you in terms of brands. Men are simple creatures. And I think that goes down under the uh, rubric of mm -hmm. things we didn't read, need research to show. Um, yes. so, so let's talk a little bit about 2021, uh, what we expect from the year ahead. And you know, the first thing that I would encourage people to think about as well, just because we've flipped over the calendar to 2021, don't expect big dramatic changes. And, and I think it sort of felt like that was gonna be the case. You know, if you looked at some of the stuff that happened right at the end of 2020, there was that viral video around, around Twisted T, and it just sort of seemed to encapsulate, you know, geez, you know, people have been, you know, so, so patient, just like the guy in that video was, was so patient and took so much verbal abuse before he finally, you know, uh, you know hit the guy with the, the Twisted T. Uh, and it just seemed like, wow, it's, you know, 2020 is over, you know, our, our patience has run out. We're just kind of, you know, feeling, you know, catharsis over this, this act that kind of went viral and then Twisted T was in, was in every meme until it was knocked out of the meme world by, by Bernie Sanders. Uh, or, you know, another example of that I thought was uh, Anderson Cooper, who made big uh, headlines on New Year's Eve, kind of getting drunk and uh, just making so many, uh, you know, interesting headlines and memes. And again, I think it sort of felt like, oh, it was a little bit of catharsis. It's been such a rough year. We're going to let our hair down and next year's going to be so much better. And then immediately we had, you know, the, the, uh, the issues at the Capitol, uh, still all kinds of issues around um, uh, conspiracy theories and, and misinformation and just general weirdness and surrealness. And I, I don't think that's going to stop. Uh, I mentioned my colleague uh, Walker Smith uh, with Kantar, and he uh, had that phrase of, you know, how do you help people live big lives in a small world? The other line that he had, I think is so powerful. He says, 2020 is going to be an 18 month year, meaning we still got six more months of essentially living in 2020. Hopefully by the summer, there'll be enough vaccines out there that, that things will change. But from a corporate planning, from a media planning point of view, that you know, consumer behavior is not going to change a whole lot over the next six months. Uh, and actually, my colleague uh, Leslie Wood from NC Solutions, we saw some of her data earlier. One of the things they do with their data, it's very interesting, is they look at you know all different aspects of consumer behavior, and they look at it by state. And what they find is that the basic behavioral patterns are really pretty consistent across states. And so whether it's a red state or a blue state, whether they're more aggressive with mass and social distancing or less aggressive, that kind of the, the basics of how we're living and stocking up on CPG and all of that kind of stuff is really pretty consistent. So I think we can expect that stuff to continue through the next six months. Uh, I do think, I'm sorry to say, we should prepare for a market correction. I mean, you can just look at a, uh, a chart of the Dow and see that that might be coming. Uh, here, we're actually looking at price earnings ratios to try to get a sense of, you know, are stocks overvalued or not? And, you know, A, you should uh, be, be cognizant of the fact that, uh, you know, look at how that, that vertical axis is laid out. It's not necessarily linear all the way up in order to, to capture some of the high highs. But basically, only twice within the last century have uh, price earnings ratios been this high and immediately been followed by, by a big downturn. So, um, so I would just encourage people to prepare for that and suggest that that might throw a, you know, a, a bit of a monkey wrench into consumers' lives. Um, 
you know, I think the, the biggest casualty of 2020 and maybe the biggest opportunity of 2021 is in, in the truth. Uh, you know, uh, you may remember this is back in 2005 when Stephen Colbert started talking about truthiness. Uh, and he actually wrote a book on it and it was sort of, it, it sort of went viral to the extent that things went viral in 2005. And it was the notion that we could just kind of say what you wanted to be true. And then if enough people sort of repeated it, that it sort of seemed true enough. And you know, obviously there's been so much data about, about uh, disinformation and the inability of people to agree on a set of data uh, that I, I think it'll be hard for our society to do anything about it. Um, I do think this is gonna become kind of the new form of information warfare that you know, we're used to seeing you know, probably some disinformation spread about China. Well, China is actually doing the same thing about us. And you know, all of the things we're saying about China creating the coronavirus, they're saying about us. So, uh, so I, I do think that's gonna create some, some motivation for, for government, for businesses to say, hey, you know, we're, we're gonna have to do something about this. Uh, and so uh, I think you're going to see some some private companies uh, step up. Uh, so you know places like Twitter, uh, you've you've seen you know uh, certainly Facebook has, has talked about that. It's sort of very controversial the extent to which uh, Facebook is is contributing to the problem uh, or or contributing to the solution. Uh, but I do think there there are huge opportunities to to you know, come up with products and services and systems that people, you know, can, can believe in and that, that provide some sense of truth. Um, and then the final slide I, I wanted to share with you, uh, I love this one. Uh, this is actually from uh, Visual Capitalist, which is a, a great site. They have amazing infographics. And uh, one of the things they did was they went out and they kind of synthesized all the different predictions about 2021 and put it onto a bingo card. And I've just added a few of my uh, editorial comments on there. Uh, they've got a couple around a big tech backlash and Facebook bend and, and possibly break. I, I don't particularly see that happening. Um, that uh, you, know, you may remember um, you know, last summer, there was a lot of talk about well, there's gonna be a big uh, 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 boycott of Facebook by advertisers and all these big advertisers were coming in it and all those big advertisers are back and Facebook stock is, is way up. Uh, and you know, we, we talked about kind of the growth of the big giants. Yes, there are some antitrust suits that are coming out now, but, um, uh, but I don't know that they're gonna have enough of an impact to, to slow the, the power of, of big tech. Um, I did uh, mention that savings rates are way up. So people are sitting uh, on, on piles of cash, uh, at least more affluent consumers. So I do think there will be a, a rebound uh, in 2021, whether it's more spending on food, experiences, people are predicting there's gonna be a huge number of weddings in the summer. Um, and the other final thing that I would mention is just thinking about you know, working from home and office life. Um, I, I, certainly a lot of that is, is gonna be here to stay, especially in terms of hybrid models. Uh, but I think if you look at you know, some of the biggest companies, places like Google and Facebook, yeah, they're not pushing their employees to come back to the office right now, uh, but they've also made it clear in certain ways that, um, that that is is eventually what they're angling for. I mean, if you think of those big tech companies, they spend millions of dollars feeding their employees because they don't want the employees spending an hour going out to lunch back when we all went to the office. How are they going to feel about everybody working from home all the time? Um, they're they're going to be angling to get back to uh, you know a more traditional office system. So yeah, there will be a lot of hybrid, but I think that. Um, we're, we're gonna snap back to a regular go to the office environment more than a lot of people might expect. So, um, so yeah, so a lot of stuff on that slide. Dan, what, what jumps out at you there? Yeah, I mean, your, your prediction of more, you know, kind of going back to the office is, it's a little bit against the norm here. I think there's a lot of talk of, you know, work from home and work from anywhere, but I, I see what you're saying that a lot of these companies have invested, you know, billions of dollars and these, you know, these offices. So right now it's okay, but I, I do see your point there where it'll be a shift back. And then um, I like what you said around, you know, obviously poised for a, re a rebound in food, travel and experiences. I think, what about, have you done any research on the sort of like the, the baby market? I mean, I think there's going to be a big baby boom, right? Of like a lot of babies being born in 2021 because of 
the mm-hmm. corona and everybody's stuck at home. We won't go into all the details here, but um, <laughs> you know, I think that's probably something that's big. So maybe the you know the childcare sort of baby uh, consumer packaged goods, and also I mean, you know, that whole market is is poised for a big twenty twenty one. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I haven't seen hard numbers on that, but you could certainly see that, you know, with with people at home more, with people just a little bit more focused on on family and kind of rethinking their priorities and their values. And, you know, maybe I've been emphasizing work too much and family not enough. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I wonder if the baby boom might come in 2022, that when, you know, when when, when the vaccine comes and we're all out mingling again, maybe that will be what uh, what sparks the baby boom. I don't know. Yeah, that's true too. You never know. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, what do you, so in, in regards to the, you know, the inequality continues to worsen, you know, so you think you're still predicting that. Uh, I think, you know, if we go back to some of your initial slides, it was, you know, what, 53 or 56 billionaires were newly minted and mm-hmm. during the Corona era. So you see that sort of trend continuing and still the, uh, maybe like the middle to lower class still struggling to make ends meet and getting by. Is that what, is that kind of what you mean there or something different? Uh, no, that's exactly what I mean. And I think mm-hmm. that uh, the whole trend toward the economy, you know, bifurcating that, you know, not just billionaires, but if you th- think of like, you know, the affluent, maybe the top 20, 25% of the country, they, mm-hmm. they have seen a lot more income growth than, say, the middle class and lower class consumers. And so mm-hmm. um, this has been going on for 40 years. And uh, yep. you know, it's really, really started since the early 80s. It's continued to pick up steam under every president, Democrats, Republicans. You know, a, a lot of presidents on both sides have come in and said, we're going to have tax cuts for everybody. And those tax cuts usually translate to a few hundred dollars in tax cuts for middle class consumers and thousands of dollars for more affluent consumers. Right. Um, right. And, and you've seen a lot of companies respond to that. Um, so it was probably about 10 years ago now, I think that uh, Procter & Gamble came out and said, you know what, we actually view the market a little bit differently than we used to. And I'm going to paraphrase, but Procter & Gamble became the biggest advertiser in the world by creating brands for the great thriving American middle class. And so, you know, if you think of, you know, Tide and Crest and those iconic kinds of brands, we're all geared toward that big, massive middle class. And that's what our economy looked like up until the 80s. But now, you know, we, we don't have that big, thriving American middle class. And so Procter & Gamble came out and said, OK, we need to rethink our strategy. What, what is our strategy in a world where Tide and Crest are purchases made by the affluent, the top 20 or 25 percent and not by everybody? Um, and so, you know, they have, you know, think of a lot of bifurcated markets that, okay, we need to have, you know, a more affluent skewing brand that's going to be high end and appeal to maybe 20% of the country. Uh, mm-hmm. And then they need more value oriented brands are going to appeal to the other 80%. Because even, even the middle class from a consumer behavior point of view is increasingly acting like consumers who are struggling even before Corona, where you had more of a value orientation and interest in coupons and Groupon back in the day. Um, uh, and then, you know, after Procter & Gamble came out and said that, Frito-Lay came out and said, oh, we view the market as two kinds of snackers, a smaller group of more affluent, less price sensitive snackers, and then a larger group of very value oriented snackers. So, uh, so I think you see this now in, in every category that you've got the top 20 or 25%, the kind of people who, you know, whose economic lives haven't really been phased by coronavirus to the bottom 80% where, you know, they're, they're really struggling. Um, you know, and when, when you think about, you know, all of those people struggling in, in the middle class. And we saw those numbers, you know, people don't necessarily think that, you know, their kids' lives are gonna be better off. Uh, you know, one thing we didn't really talk about was, you know, the, the election and kind of the, the failure of mm-hmm. polls. But the one thing that I, I would say about that, I think it's kind of a, a wake up call for us who think about, about trends and about consumers is that, you know, over 70 million people voted for Trump, you know? Mm-hmm. And, you know, we can't just say, well, they're all stupid. Well, they're all racist, mm-hmm. not, not 70 million people. I mean, there's, mm-hmm. we as, as consumer insights experts have to look at that and say, wow, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, want a different direction. A lot of people are, are hurting. And I think, you know, cause so many of us in, in marketing and advertising, 
we're in that top 20, 25% as our, our friends and neighbors. And we just, we kind of see that bubble. And you know, I think that's part of why nationally representative research like the kind that we do is, is so important. Yeah, no, I, I would definitely agree there. And I think what, what's interesting too is, you know, some of your predictions I actually didn't really like. I don't really like the market correcting, Stephen. So if you could, you know, <laughs> if you could like, you know, use your influence to keep that going up, I'd appreciate that. Well, maybe you're, um, not, maybe you're not investing enough in GameStop. Hey, I know I should be. I need to spend more time on Reddit, apparently, and then I'll, I'll know what's, what's, what's poised for a breakout. Yeah, uh, move, move your whole 401k over to GameStop stock. And you should find <laughs> there we go. No, we're not predicting that. Okay, so don't, don't do that, no. <laughs> uh, perfect. Well, I know we have about nine minutes or so. There's some questions that have been coming in. Let's just, I think let's jump right to the Q&A if that works for you. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, so yeah. there's a few yeah. few questions here. Um, let's see. So let's start with. Uh, so Isabella asks, "What do you think will happen to the restaurant industry in 2021?" It's it's interesting. We didn't really mention this outside of people needing that third place, but mm -hmm. any thoughts on on the restaurant industry, Stephen? I, I think that if things go according to plan, meaning that by the summer that the vaccine has been pretty widely distributed, I think there's a real uh, hunger, pardon the pun, uh, <laughs> to, to go back to restaurants. Um, and, you know, there was even a while kind of before the most recent, you know, realms of, of shutdown where, you know, a, a lot of restaurants were open and bars were open. And I, I would say, you know, not to sound too flip about it, but it's almost like, you know, people were, were dying to go back to those experiences, like even knowing mm -hmm. the risks, there was just such a hunger. There's just something so relaxing about going out to a restaurant and sitting down and having a drink and have someone else serve something for you. Um, and just all the social connection and the experience, uh, people are so hungry to get back to that. Um, and actually, when we did our, our first uh, wave last summer, we had some uh, uh, data around, you know, spending projections in different categories. And restaurants and travel were definitely the two where we saw a lot of, of pent up demand. Uh, yeah, yep, yep. I think that's I think that's right. And that kind of leads into another question that um, someone asked around predictions for the travel industry or tourism in general. Uh, what's the outlook there? It's obviously yeah. positive, but any, anything specific that you can touch on? Yeah, I think uh, I think the same kind of thing. There's a lot of hunger to get out there and and start traveling again. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when coronavirus start, first started happening, there was kind of a, a return of the Great American Road Trip, and and I think we might see that first because uh, again, just like flipping over the calendar to 2021 wasn't some magic date where now suddenly everything is different. It's going to be the same thing with the vaccine that you know, we're having problems getting it out and then some people aren't gonna to wanna to take it and how effective is it and still have to wear a mask is mm -hmm. there's gonna be a lot of that kind of uncertainty to work through. And so I wonder if while we work through that uncertainty, maybe the desire for, for road trips might come back and then maybe you know, hotels might come back and then probably airline travel is, is gonna be last. Um, It'll also be interesting to see how the whole notion of cleanliness plays out in travel. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you know, we talk, you know, you know, Hilton partnering with Lysol and instituting all of these different programs to show cleanliness. Well, you know, what's that going to mean for, say, Airbnb, where, you know, you know what, you probably mm -hmm. don't have those same kind of cleanliness and quality standards. I mean, Airbnb has been crushing hotels for the past few years. It'll be interesting to see how that dynamic changes. Right. Yeah, that's interesting, actually. You almost need the like a Lysol seal of approval or something, you know? Um, yeah. Interesting. What, what about, we talked a lot about major companies. Um, there was a question around anything with small businesses. Have you done any research on that and how, obviously, a lot of them have struggled, but how they might come out of the pandemic once, you know, vaccines and things start to open up a little bit? Uh, you know, I don't have hard data, but I certainly see anecdotally a strong desire of consumers to support small businesses. Uh, obviously, the corona economy has been a disaster for many small businesses, and it's been, it's been great, financially speaking, for a place like Amazon. Uh, you know, Amazon, uh, they, uh, you know, 
they, they sort of toned down their Prime Day celebrations uh, last year. Mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. talking to a colleague and I said, gee, what do you think of that? You know, Amazon kind of toned down Prime Day. And he says, every day since coronavirus started has been Prime Day for Amazon. It's true. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, because it's just, it's so easy, it's so convenient and you don't want to go outside and it's contactless delivery. Uh, but I think that psychologically, there's, there's this really strong desire to help small businesses and that people have seen so many businesses in their community struggle. Uh, I know like for me where I live, you know, I'm often on uh, next door or, uh, you know, you know, local Facebook groups and you see a tremendous focus on, um, you know, you know, the desire to, to help small businesses there. So, uh, so I, I think that that could be a lasting trend consumer desire to not only psychologically support small business, but to spend their money differently when when things open back up. Interesting, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, There's another another question on um, carbon capture. Do you mm. have any knowledge? And specifically around if we were trending that from when you know we did the study and then now, um, have we done, I don't think we've done anything else on that or have you, Stephen? Uh, again, not hard data. I did put carbon capture technology on my list of, uh, uh, of, of winners of 2020, really more based on what mm -hmm. I think will happen in 2021, uh, where you've had Elon Musk come out and very strongly support it. Uh, and I think that you're going to see from the Biden administration a real focus on climate change. And I think there's going to be a recognition that consumer behavior isn't going to change that much. You know, and especially if you look at places like like China and India, where, you know, certainly in the U.S., we, we put out plenty of our own carbon, but other other countries do, too. And I'm just I've always kind of been skeptical of how much consumer behavior can change to make differences in those areas. So mm -hmm. I think we're going to need technological solutions. So I, I, I think things like carbon capture strategies, I, I think, are going to be a big topic of conversation in the coming year. Interesting, interesting. And then maybe one, maybe a final question here. Maybe this is a good way mm -hmm. to end it, but sort of, you know, do you believe that consumers' perception will change as a vaccine, you know, gets introduced and is more, you know, getting widespread? What, what sort of effects do you think there? Is it, do you think it's getting back to like the, you know, the new normal, as people say, or what are your, what are your thoughts there? Um, I, I think uh, this, this may uh, bum you out as much as my stock market chart. But oh, I think, Stephen, I, don't do it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be 2022 before we mm. really get back because, like I said, you know, you know, people are excited about the vaccine. I think most people are going to take the vaccine, but there are going to be discussions about some people don't want to and then how effective is it. And it's, it's not going to be a, hey, you know, June 30th, we had a problem. And July 1st, we don't have a problem anymore, thanks to the vaccine. Mm -hmm. It's going to mm -hmm. be a much longer transition and period of turmoil and period of uncertainty. So, um, so I, I think it will be toward the end of 2021 or beyond before, you know, consumer eyes are fully back to normal. Interesting. All right. No, that makes sense. I, I think you're right in that prediction. It'll take more time, especially if this is a eight, you know, 2020 is an 18 month year, right? And there's still that yeah. hangover from it. So I think you're spot on there. Well, I, Stephen, I think with that, we can wrap it up. I appreciate all your you know, insights and going back to 2020, your predictions for 2021. So appreciate that. Everybody will be sending out a recording of this. So you'll be getting that. And then if you want more from Stephen or I, you know, we're pretty active on LinkedIn and you can find us there. And with that, Stephen, hey, thanks so much for coming on today and sharing your predictions. My pleasure. Always a pleasure, Dan. I appreciate it. Looking forward to uh, the next one we do down the road. All right. Sounds great. All right. Take care, everyone. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.